and we're good to go. Yeah. So. So. Laurent Vincent. Thank you. Yep. Uh, thanks for the great intro. I was very impressed this morning uh, when talking to uh, different people to see how many people speak French. I was so impressed. I, I thought I could do the rest of the presentation of français, okay? <laughs> No, honestly, I was, uh, I was super impressed. So during these uh, 15 minutes uh, with uh, Vincent, we're going to uh, discuss about uh, living documentation and the way we are a tip test uh, turning this living documentation, which is one of the great benefit and outcome of using BDD, how we turn living documentation is into a strategic and a business asset. So um, quick words about uh, the speakers. I'm Laurent. I'm a product guy. Uh, I co-founded uh, yeah, IPTest uh, four years ago, and I'm a big believer in, uh, in BDD. Not only I'm a big believer, but we have developed a solution uh, that supports behavior-driven development, and we are practitioners, so we use uh, BDD on a regular basis. And I'm super happy to run this session with Vincent, who is my uh, favorite uh, buggy developer. I do lots of bugs. And he will share with you one, one failure, by the way. One so uh, I just have, uh, as product uh, guy, one religion, which is short feedback loop. So the sooner, the faster we can go from ID to production, uh, the better it is, because it means, as an organization, as uh, individuals, we have the opportunity to learn from production and then to make better decisions for uh, the next iteration. But not only uh, we should try to have uh, as a quick feedback loop uh, as possible, but we also have the opportunity to test and learn at every stage uh, of, the, of the pipeline. So if we, and, and that's typically the uh, continuous testing process uh, that we use uh, at tip test, and that's our solution support. So at the ID level, we're going to explore um, the business problem our customers came out with great ideas, uh, new features or new problems they would like us to fix. So we explore the problems, we explore the potential solutions, and for that, BDD is super helpful. So there are many techniques, example mappings. Many people have talked about that, so I'm not going to uh, explain why BDD is uh, great to address uh, this kind of problem, to align the team and create a shared understanding. So out of uh, this um, uh, session, we have our beautiful examples uh, that we're going to use to drive development, but we can also um, use these examples to go back to the customers and share with them, making sure that we're going to build the right thing. So that's a first uh, a test, a first way uh, to get some, uh, some feedback. Once we are convinced we are going to develop the right thing, uh, so developers uh, automate these examples, they do TDD, uh, they make all the tests pass, and uh, after the, the, the implementation, once all the tests pass, you need integration and the BDD scenarios. We are confident that what has been developed meets the business requirements. And usually, that's end of the story, because we know that testing ends after the CI, right? What happens after the CI? It's no more a problem. No, it is our problem, and that's, in fact, where things are getting even more interesting. Once the feature now is in the end of real user, we have the opportunity to test and learn again. And that's where typically uh, uh, we're uh, using living documentation, aggregating data, so we'll see analytics, application performance, and so on. Uh, on these features, on this living documentation, can be a really strategic asset that help us iterate and make the the right decision for the next uh, uh, iteration. So we're going to uh, mainly focus on uh, the last two questions. Uh, is it meaningful? So once the feature is in production, how can we answer uh, to this question? And does it have a great impact uh, on, the, on the users? So that's how we use living documentation at it. But to start with, uh, Vincent is going to share with us a, a failure story. Yeah, I love sharing failures we, we've had at IPTest and how we learned from it. So, uh, just to give with context in IPTest, so in IPTest you can write your scenario, execute them, get results, and so on. 
of course, lots of people want to also have uh, at least complete uh, those test results from unit tests, things they don't want to discuss with product and so on. So what we've developed a few years ago was the possibility to uh, push back uh, JUnit XML reports or Cucumber JSON reports and so on. So yeah, we can complete uh, the scenario written uh, by the product developers during free Amiga session with more specific tests to the unit ones. It was a basic feature, it worked fine, it was tested. Uh, we didn't do much advertisement on it, just, yeah, it's there, just some documentation. Everything went fine. And after a few months, we started having the, the application really slow, really all the, the delayed job stack were clogged and so on, and everything felt really slow. So, yeah, of course. We did what we had to do, so trying to get what was the problem, and the problem, surprisingly or not, was uh, this possibility to push the results back from unit tests. Because what we didn't see was, first it was slow, and then it was massively used. It was under the radar, it was like, yeah, it's just one feature, we don't really care about it. And no, in fact, it was really massively used, and basically breaking the user experience for everyone on the app, even those who didn't use it, because it was making all the thing slow. So we decided, not again, or at least we tried to. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is present one uh, of the latest uh, feature we've added in IpTest, which is a pretty simple one. It's the possibility when you destroy a feature to say, no, we can recover it. Yeah, we took some time to, to make it, but no, it's there. Anyway, uh, how did we work on this feature to avoid uh, having the same issue than we had with uh, the capability to push uh, the results back? So, once again, we've got uh, two questions to answer. So, is it meaningful? And will it break uh, the user experience for all the IP test users, even those who don't need to restore the folders? So, what we've been relying on on the last few years was this kind of dashboard, it's in all our uh, offices, and basically what's interesting there is the, the top line, everything is green, our servers are working fine, yoo-hoo, and some other data, but not interesting there. So here everything is fine, and suddenly things start to get red, not every day, hopefully, uh, and at the moment it goes red, yeah, we stop working on what we are doing and trying to fix the issue. That's a great way to react uh, to the troubles. But can we do more than simply react to I the troubles? I receive a, a message, so I want to make sure that maybe it's not hard coded every time it's green, so I also receive a message. It's even available in, uh, on the web. We can monitor everything that's happening. Anyway, uh, so yeah, it's a great way to react to problem. But can we try to predict uh, the problem that may be uh, caused by features? So to avoid any uh, trouble, what we start doing now on all the new features, well, most of the time at least, is say, okay, we are going to analyze uh, different metrics on all the features to see what's happening for each one. So here, for example, it's just the psychic uh, job duration for a uh, trash feature, just one example. But what we see is, yeah, it's going pretty fine. So this line here is about 20 seconds. So in the last 90 days or last two weeks, I can't remember, uh, we see that worst case scenario, it took a 16 second run. You complete that with the number of jobs that have been executed. You know how much of uh, your sidekick uh, pipeline is filled with uh, this kind of thing. For those of you who don't use Sidekick, first you're right, and secondly, it's uh, just a way to delay job uh, and not uh, have the main server and all the issues. So with this, we, are, we have the capaci capacity to see when one feature is going to more or less break the whole application. We see that everything goes up because loads and loads of people are using it and every time it takes three to four, minute, four minutes to run, of course it's going to yeah, clog the, the pipe and we are going to experience real issues. Those kind of things, it's not the only one, of course, for each feature, that's slow. It's a small uh, graph, but at least with more and more and more metrics, we are, cap we are uh, capable uh, to see if one feature is going to break the user experience for everyone using the application. But that doesn't answer the other question. Is 
this feature meaningful? Will they have a benefit from it, our users? So, same principle, different tool there, so it's uh, amplitude. And here we are looking how many times uh, people are using it every day. We knew in the example of the crash that it was going to be useful because we've spent months having people at the support saying, I click this big red button saying I'm going to lose everything. And once I clicked on it, I lost everything. And <laughs> yeah, OK. They didn't say it this way, but the idea was there. So of course, we knew people would need this kind of feature. But tracking that, it's really helpful because we can say, OK, if no one uses it, Maybe there's a real issue. Maybe the button is too hidden. Maybe people don't understand what's happening. Maybe people stopped pressing on this big red button. I don't trust the last one. So with this kind of metrics, we are now able to know if each of the features we deliver, we add uh, in the product, is meaningful and if it's worth uh, working on it. So we gather lots and lots of data. Not, those, uh, not only those ones, but uh, these are two examples. And once we gather data, that's always great. But basically, we need to not gather for gathering, but make decisions from it. And I'll let the and, product uh, guy know what to do with it. An interesting thing with uh, this particular example is that during the Free Amigo session, we had a couple of discussions on how long should we keep the elements in the trash before deleting them. And uh, is it one day, a week, a month, a year? We had no clue. So we just made an assumption. Let's start with a week, and we'll see. And here, we can monitor uh, how long um, people are restoring, um, how many days uh, do they need before they restore the, uh, the element. And, and we've seen that with, within a period of two or three days, uh, almost that. everything has been, uh, has been restored. The so, blue part is uh, restoring on the first day. Yeah, so yeah. more or less everyone restores just after. So that's interesting. Now, with this living documentation, where we also aggregate other data coming from application performance monitoring, coming from uh, uh, amplitude, so the, the usage, we have an asset that tells us, and, and me as a, a product guy, uh, if we made the right investment, if it's worth to continue investing in it, or if we should maybe uh, uh, remove, the, remove the feature. So that's typically the, um, uh, the quadrant that, uh, that we use. Uh, a feature should either be in the red or uh, the green zone. And uh, if I take for uh, the example of uh, the improve and, uh, and promote, so uh, we did at some point uh, develop a feature that was uh, requested by the users. So we thought it's a pretty safe bet, right? Uh, we deploy it and nobody used it. So there was no impact on production, on the overall user experience, but nobody used it. So why? So we started to dig into the, the, the problem, and the thing is just people did not realize that the feature was here. So we had to continue investing in it, to making it more visible, we can promote it, or there are different techniques to, to do so. So making sure that the, the feature would uh, move from there to there. But one very important thing that I learned, uh, I created two startups, um, been involved in a couple of others, is that a product is not just about keep adding more and more features. Sometimes we have to remove uh, some of the features. That's very hard to do. There will always be users that will complain. But for the health of the product, if we want to keep a sustainable pace for the future, we have to, uh, to remove features. So that's yeah, one of the great learning. And now we can do that based on data. It's not just, I guess. No, we have the data. We learn from that. And then we, we know what's the uh, next best features uh, we should uh, invest on based on uh, this data. So that's how we leverage living documentation and, and product uh, analytics uh, at IPTEST. And I think yeah. we just have 30 seconds. And in the 30 seconds left, just to get back to this one, uh, that's just an example of what we gave. We use data analytics like this, but we, are, we strongly believe that uh, this works for us, but maybe in your company, well, you'll need any more meaningful information. It's not uh, yeah, limited to this example. Thank uh, you. 15 seconds. <laughs>